got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? What's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, praise team, for that entry. Turn to somebody and say, what's love got to do with it? Now turn to somebody else and say, everything. Thank you, Pastor Randy, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to say thank you to this praise team for the wonderful music, uh, for the wonderful hospitality that I have experienced every time I've been here. Uh, you have been so kind. And Susan, I don't know where you are, but Susan has been, uh, she's really good at hurting a bishop. <laughs> And I am so grateful for her hospitality and for her grace and for her warm conversation. And that is what I have experienced every time I've been in this church. So thank you so much. You heard all the things about my official titles, but tell, let me tell you something else about me. I grew up in the Baptist church and what I heard in that church was Jesus as fire insurance. I needed to believe in Jesus so that I would not go you know where. And so I wandered away from the church for a period of my life. And when I came back, I came back to the church in the context of a new church start with worship that feels just like this. And what I heard there was that God so loved me that God sent God's son, that whosoever believed might be saved, that God so loved me, that God had written my name in the palm of God's hand, that God loved me with an everlasting love. And so we say in the ministry that preachers have one sermon and I only have one. It's about love. So what does love have to do with it? Join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for your love poured down on us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your call to love. And we ask in this moment, O oh God, that your word, your word of love would become flesh and live amongst us. Oh Lord, hide me in the shadow of the cross so that your people would not see me or anything that I have done, but that they would see you and understand what you did for them on the cross and what you called them to do in the world. Help us to understand differently and better what love has to do with any of it. We ask this in the name and spirit of the Christ. Amen. You heard that wonderful rendition of that chorus, What's Love Got to Do With It? How many of you have uh, either seen the movie or seen the musical about Tina Turner's life? How many? Raise some hands out there. Okay, some of you have. I saw it produced in London. I saw the, uh, the musical, the stage production in London. It was wonderful. And what I learned in the course of watching that were some things that I did not know about Tina Turner. She was originally part of a band with her husband, Ike. It was the Ike and Tina Turner show. But Ike, what many people didn't know, Ike was a violent man. And Tina Turner was the victim of intimate partner violence. And friends, for Tina Turner, love had nothing to do with that. 
You see, love has nothing to do with hurting another person or being hurt by someone who is supposed to care for you. Love has nothing to do with domestic violence or with violence of any kind. Love has nothing to do with the violence that is swirling in our world right now. You know what I mean. The conflict in Haiti, the terrible violence and war in the Congo, the war in Ukraine, the terrible war that is happening in the Holy Land, that horrible attack against Israel, and then the response that has led to a terrible humanitarian crisis. Love has nothing to do with that. Love has nothing to do with some of the things that are happening here, here at home. The attack against our nation's capital on January 6th. The shootings that seem to happen everywhere all the time. The violent language that we hear. Language that dehumanizes some of the most vulnerable among us. Love has nothing to do with any of it. But love, love has everything to do with our faith. Scripture tells us that God is love and that our greatest commandments are to love. Love has everything to do with our Christian faith because love is at the center of our faith. It is the very foundation of our identity. Love has everything to do with who we are. Now that passage in the Gospel of John says so. You saw it on the screen in the NRSV version and you heard it read by Pastor Randy from the Common English Bible. And what you have to know is that prior to this discourse that you heard read, Jesus is talking to his disciples about their identity, about who they are in relationship to him. And this is what he says. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain, if you abide in me and I in you, you will produce good fruit. Then in the verses shared this morning, he says, remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide, remain in my love. Now what these passages suggest is that as, as branches that come from Christ, who is the true vine, we have the same root system as he did. We have the same sap running through our veins as he did. And we are to produce the same fruit that he did. We are to produce love. That's because our root system is grounded in the love of Christ. The sap that runs through our veins is seeped in the love of Christ. And the fruit we produce, if we abide in him, is the same fruit that he produced in the healing of the sick, the giving sight to the blind, the raising up of the dispossessed, and the reaching out to the marginalized. That fruit is love. Love identifies us, friends, as followers of Jesus Christ and directs our very being. Love empowers our ministry in Christ and is its fruit. Friends, we are the outgrowth of the true vine, Jesus Christ, who is love. Now I've heard from your pastor, Pastor Randy, and I heard some from Susan as well, a little bit about who you are. I have heard that you built a hospital in Haiti and then started a microfinancing program for women there to lift them out of poverty. I have heard, and where's Denny over there? I see you. I have heard that you mentor young people and I've been told that that ministry began with coaching basketball. And when it was over, one of the kids says, coach, what's next? And you answered with a ministry that has transformed lives. I've been told, friends, 
that you minister to the unhoused in your community, that you open the doors of this church to provide showers for people who can't take showers, to provide a warm and safe bed, to provide food and fellowship. I've heard about you. I've heard that you pour yourself out for those that you have made your friends. And so I asked myself, what does love have to do with what I've heard about Providence? Love has everything to do with what I have heard because love has everything to do with who you are and who we all are as a United Methodist Church. Now friends, I don't wanna spend long, a long time here, but I wanna say one more thing about this text. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. That's verse 10. Now I imagine that John is talking about the two greatest commandments. You know what they are, you shall what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind and your soul and you shall Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what I think John must be talking about. But what I'm curious about, what I'm wondering about in this passage is the use of the word if. If? If signals the beginning of a conditional clause. The use of this word suggests that there is a condition connected to a choice. We can either keep God's commandments to love and so remain in Christ's love, or we can choose not to. Now, I don't wanna suggest that our salvation and our growth in Christ must do solely with our behavior or with our choices. If I dared suggest that, I know that there are some theologians out there, the whole pastoral staff, in fact, would probably correct me and they would tell me about God's prevenient grace, that grace that according to John Wesley, our founder, reaches out to us and compels us to the love of God in Christ even before we are aware of it. And I know that if I dared suggest some kind of works righteousness, the theologians among us would tell me that all of the work of our justification of being made right with God was done through the justifying work of God and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross who died for us. So I don't dare, friends, I don't dare suggest for even a moment that our choices are what transforms us in love. Because the theologians out there or those online, and I know you are there, you would tell me that according to our Wesleyan theology, it is not our works, but the Holy Spirit that perfects us in love. You would assure me that we don't do any of the work of our own salvation and growth and grace and love. God does the work by God's Holy Spirit and by God's sanctifying grace. And of course, you would be right. But still, the text says, if, if. It seems to suggest that we have a choice to remain in Christ's love or not to. It seems to suggest that we have a choice to keep the greatest commandment to love God and neighbor or not to. It seems to suggest that we have a choice to love or not to love the text seems to suggest that we have a choice. And friends, we are at a time when our choices are of particular importance. Because we are at a time when the principalities and powers of racism and xenophobia and misogyny and homophobia and all other forms of exclusion are swirling around us and telling us not to love those people. We're at a time when violent ideologies are swirling around us and telling us that love is weak or passe or just won't get the job done. 
Friends, in the midst of this swirling maelstrom, our faith cannot be a passive faith. Our faith must be an intentional faith in which we make a choice to love, an intentional faith in which love becomes our primary witness. Now you all know that we are coming to the last week of our general conference and I know that there's some delegates out there, uh, one from uh, Iowa, Kathy Mitchell is out there and I know a couple of other delegates are out there. Some folks who have been involved in this, a lot of you have been involved in volunteering at this general conference, we have already and will continue to make some momentous decisions. We're all over the secular press. NPR, AP, they're looking at what is the United Methodist Church deciding. Now as important as all of that is, I do not believe that the decisions we make at this general conference are the most important decisions that we will make. Listen to that. The decisions that we make here in Charlotte, as important as they are, are not the most important decisions that we will make. I believe that the most important decisions that we will make will be the decisions about what we will do and how we will be the day after General Conference. No matter what we feel about the decisions made by this General Conference, the most important question that will guide our behavior the day after is this. Will we remain in Christ's love? Will we continue to feed the hungry? Will we continue to house the unhoused? Will we continue to mentor young people in our communities and around the world? Will we continue in our ministries to heal the sick and support the broken? Will we continue to advocate for the dispossessed? Will we continue to carry out the mission of the United Methodist Church to make disciples of all people and to transform the world. Will we continue, friends, to join in God's transforming mission in the world by loving like Christ loved? Now there is a document that the General Conference is considering and it's called Sent in Love. It is a document that outlines our ecclesiology, which is just the fancy word to say what we believe about the nature of the church, especially our uniquely Wesleyan way of being the church. It describes or seeks to describe who we are as United Methodists. Now I commend the whole document to you, but I just want to leave you with this short excerpt. It says, as Christians experiencing the saving love of God, we are drawn together into a new community of praise and thanksgiving, mutual care, and spiritual support. We are entrusted with a radical mission, a prophetic witness and loving service in the world. In this new community, Christians are restored by divine love and formed into the redeemed and redeeming fellowship we call the church. Our life together as United Methodists is caught up in the wider drama of God's saving action in the world. We are joined together with other Christians in the one body of Christ and called and sent in love with all Christians to participate in the one saving mission of God. Do you hear in that reading the answer to the question I posed to you earlier? What does love have to do with it? Well, friends, we are here because we have experienced the saving love of God in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. What's love got to do with it? 
Well, we are here because we have been given the radical invitation to join in God's mission of prophetic witness and loving service in the world. I hear that this church will be ministering to refugees out of Ukraine and to young people traumatized that war. Can I get an amen? What's love got to do with it? Friends, we are here as a new community in Christ, restored, restored from our brokenness and sin, restored by divine love and formed into the redeemed and redeeming church. Providence, can I get an amen? amen. What's love got to do with it? Well, friends, we are sent in love to participate in God's mission in the world. What's love got to do with it? Love has everything to do with it because love has everything to do with who you are. In the name of the God who is love, in the name of the Christ who redeemed us in love, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who continues to transform and perfect and lift us up in love. Amen.